pneumatics can be fun. Uh, most of my arcade machines have some pneumatics in addition to all the motors. Um, they have a sort of different quality of uh, motion, which uh, is uh, entertaining. Run down and get up to the big boat. Here to avoid the obstacles. Feed for as long as you dare, but take off before you get swatted. So, as usual, here's the contents list and um, my usual reminder that uh, uh, the videos are about my own experience of using the components. Uh, I'm not a professional pneumatics expert. So, air power or pneumatics uh, goes back a long way. Um, maybe the first use was just for blowguns shooting poisoned darts at animals and things. Um, but also bellows. Um, they're getting fires going. And by Roman times, they were also using bellows um, to power organs to provide the air supply. And of course, this went on through history. All the churches in medieval times had somebody blowing away on bellows to uh, keep the organ um, powered while uh, another person actually played it. And by the 18th century, there were also tiny bellows uh, for cuckoo clocks. But the big change in the 19th century, though, was that with all the metalworking tools and techniques, uh, Rather than using bellows, you could use cylinders to compress air or to use them as actuators to make things move. And these were much more uh, efficient and uh, could withstand much higher pressures. Um, if I connect a couple together and I compress the air in one, uh, it'll compress it enough to make the other one move. But we're still working at very low pressures uh, in this case. Uh, to get to higher pressures, you need something a bit more sophisticated, something more like a bicycle pump. So this is just a cylinder with a piston in the middle. Um, but the difference is this has got a valve. So on the outstroke, you're um, sucking in air from the outside. But on the downstroke, all this air is uh, being forced into the tyre. It's the only way it can get out. Uh, and so if you pump and pump and pump, each stroke is making a little more air go into the tyre and getting to a higher and higher pressure. And really electric air compressors, today's compressors, are, are exactly the same. Uh, this is one, my compressors, uh, one that uh, uh, got overheated so I took it to bits. Um, and so most of it is actually, this is a motor on the back and the actual compressor on the front. And in here, this is the piston that goes up and down. So it's only a short stroke, much shorter than the bicycle pump, but it's going round at uh, thousands of times a minute. Uh, and so it actually generates quite a lot of compressed air. So the basic principles of pneumatics really aren't that complicated. The devil is in the detail, and uh, that's really what this video is about. Pneumatic cylinders come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. They're much bigger ones than my biggest one, the one at the front. Uh, and they go down to really, really tiny ones. Um, this is my smallest. And I find these tiny ones very useful, particularly with uh, the 2 mil uh, fine flexible tubing. It's one of the advantages of pneumatics is the way it scales so well from big stuff down to tiny stuff. I think perhaps the cylinders, one confusion about them for beginners is the difference between 
uh, pneumatic cylinders and hydraulic cylinders. Uh, pneumatics, the pipes and cylinders are full of air, in hydraulics they're full of oil. Uh, and hydraulics usually run at much, much higher pressures, so uh, with air it's about four to six bar, um, but with hydraulics it could be a couple of hundred bar. So they're much, much more powerful, uh, which you need for diggers and things like that. But for me that power um, isn't, I don't need that much power, and uh, hydraulics is messy invariably the oil gets everywhere at some point or another. Another thing to remember is that uh, compressed air uh, or, or gases really they're, they're compressible so it's actually springy this force on the on, on the piston. Uh, this is in contrast to hydraulics where the cylinders are full of uh, oil and liquids aren't compressible. So with hydraulics you can stop a cylinder halfway. Uh, with pneumatics you can't really. Um, it's either or in or it's out. <laughs> uh, and that's just something you get used to, uh, the limitations of working with pneumatics. It doesn't usually bother me. I, uh, it's, it, I accept it before I even start working with them. I thought uh, I'd show you some particular uses that I put them to on my arcade machines next. So with Renter Dog, uh, all the motions are electric. Uh, Dotty's head, legs, and tail, um, and the treadmill, of course. But the lead is different. The lead is pneumatic, and that gives this gives it quite a lot of power. And uh, a sort of jerkiness. It's a different quality of movement that uh, just adds to the whole thing somehow. Evacuation. Call the National Helpline for further details. All calls are charged at one pound a second. Before leaving, please collect your nuclear waste. Welcome to Money Laundering. Your task is to pick up the cash from the gutter. Now, try to lift the cash to the top, but watch out for the financial regulators on the right. If one of them sees the cash when they look out of the window, you've been spotted and you'll lose it all. Fortunately, the regulators can only look straight ahead, so you're safe if the cash is above or below their eye level. Oh dear. So you probably thought the um, coins were released uh, on money laundering by an electromagnet uh, when it was my original idea. But I couldn't find uh, a cable that was flexible enough and strong enough to support the weight of the, the coins. So uh, I ended up using pneumatic tubing instead. I think this is 3mm. Uh, so in here there's a little pneumatic ram, a little cylinder, pulled up by a rare earth magnet on the bottom of the cylinder. 
And then there's a, a thin titanium plate underneath that they're actually touching. So when I retract the um, rare earth magnet from the uh, titanium, uh, it reduces the magnetic effect on the coins uh, and so they drop. It's very satisfying. Oh, so one last thing about basic cylinders, um, buying them. There now is a, a sort of real choice. Uh, all the traditional brands, SMC, Festo and the rest, they're all pretty much the same price. But on eBay you can now buy incredibly cheap ones from uh, China. They're literally about a quarter of the price. I tried them on one machine and uh, they work, they're pretty basic. Uh, I would say the main difference was that there was more friction uh, in the piston sometimes and it sort of varied uh, from one cylinder to another uh, and also seemed to vary uh, while I was using them. So I think it's all right if you're powering the ram in both directions with compressed air uh, but it happened to be a situation where I was letting it fall by gravity and uh, then the friction was too much uh, to let the ram down. So I guess there's a bit of you get what you pay for but the Chinese ones still are bargains. Pressure is defined as force divided by area, or as I more often use the equation uh, to find out the force I'm going to get from a pneumatic cylinder, uh, I, it's the air pressure uh, from the compressor uh, multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the cylinder gives me approximately the force that I'm going to get out of the cylinder. So in this example, uh, at a uh, pressure of 40 psi and an area of two uh, square inches, I'm going to get a force of 80 pounds. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll think, why am I uh, doing this in pounds per square inch psi? Well, the answer is that uh, the units for measuring pressure are a complete mess. Uh, most gauges have several different ones on. Uh, and the metric ones, there's pascals and megapascals and uh, tor uh, and kilograms force per square centimetre. It, it's just all a bit of a muddle really. And I grew up with uh, pounds per square inch uh, and a bit like miles an hour, it's still the one that's uh, most intuitive. There is one other one though that uh, I do like and that is uh, the atmosphere or also called one bar, one atmosphere. And that is the average pressure of the air all around us. And um, so that has a sort of intuitive feel. So I know my compressors kick out about six bar. And uh, the useful thing about that is that one bar is 14.5 PSI, pounds per square inch. So that's quite easy to convert. Um, and the one I tend to forget, but I think this is right, is that a uh, 100 kilopascals are also roughly one bar, but it is confusing. So this is my workshop compressor. Um, it's a fairly standard layout with a motor uh, and a compressor sitting on a big tank. Um, this one's real antique. Uh, I've had it for 50 years or so and uh, I was told that the compressor itself came off an old tank transporter. Uh, despite its enormous size it's not actually that powerful, it's about seven cubic feet per minute. The point of the tank is so that there's a reservoir of uh, compressed air um, so the motor doesn't have to run all the time. So one thing I added to uh, this compressor was a solenoid valve so that uh, when um, the motor first switches on, uh, all the air from the compressor is just vented out into the open again. Uh, this means the motor can start up without any load. Uh, after a few seconds, once it's got up to speed, uh, the valve closes and then all the air is forced into uh, the receiver tank. This is one of the compressors I use in my arcades. Uh, it's a particularly quiet one because compressors can be really noisy up to 90 or even 95 decibels. Uh, this one's just 42 decibels. Uh, the motor and the pump uh, are all inside this aluminium pot. 
Uh, it's actually very similar to a fridge compressor, um, only of course that's pumping refrigerant gas rather than pumping air. Uh, and like many compressors, this one uh, isn't continuously rated. If you ran it all the time, it would overheat. Uh, so I had these uh, timers to them so that they, they powered for five minutes and then they're switched off for five minutes. And this doesn't matter because um, the air goes into the tank uh, at seven bar, uh, and, but it only goes out to the machines at three bar. So there's a lot of spare air <laughs> to feed the machines uh, while the compressor's switched off. This is a motor and compressor unit from a similar compressor. But uh, what uh, amazed me most is that sitting on top of the uh, piston is uh, the valve plate. And the valves are just unbelievably simple. They're just springy bits of metal. So uh, underneath here, there are two holes. And so on the upstroke, uh, the bit of metal springs up and allows the air out, but on the downstroke it snaps shut and amazingly forms just a metal to metal seal is at is completely airtight and stops the, uh, the air going back in. Uh, on the reverse there's uh, an identical arrangement under this uh, curved metal strip. The springy bit of metal is actually in, in, inside there. Uh, it's amazing that something so simple could work so well. Uh, there's actually a third sort of compressor that um, I probably should just mention called a screw compressor. Uh, this is used in factories when you want a large amount of air. And it's these two very cleverly machined helixes uh, that mesh together uh, very, very tightly. And they trap a pocket of air and then they're machined so as it, the air travels up the helix, the pocket of gets smaller and smaller and smaller so it compresses the air trapped inside. Uh, they're very difficult to machine these things so they're always cost thousands and thousands of pounds um, but they're great because they don't need valves it just it's a continuous flow of compressed air uh, and so the whole thing is, is quite efficient if you need uh, air in, in quantity like that. But whatever sort of compressor you use, the air always gets very hot. It's just the physics of the process. Uh, so pneumatics is never really a very energy efficient business. So on the outlet of a compressor, uh, there are extra little bits and pieces. Uh, there's a pressure regulator first that uh, uh, controls the pressure of the air that actually comes out. And these are surprisingly simple. So this is uh, a pressure regulator where I've just taken um, the top off. And basically inside, uh, there's just a big spring. And the spring bears down on this bit of rubber. Uh, and underneath, uh, there's a little plate here uh, with a little button that that pushes down on and the, and the more that goes down the more air it lets out. Well the tighter you you clamp down the spring on top with this screw um, the the higher the pressure before it lets any air out the other end and surprisingly this simple arrangement uh, controls the pressure very accurately. Uh, it's been around for a long time and no real need to improve it. Uh, though today uh, of course there are uh, clever digital ones. Um, this one you feed in a voltage 0 to 10 volt analog and that controls the uh, pressure that uh, it allows to pass. But then there's a, a second uh, pressure regulator on a compressor and this one on this side is what switches the motor on when the pressure in the tank gets low and switches it off when it gets high. So uh, that, this is one of these things um, and uh, that's the pressure it's set at about 2 bar and the differential is the difference between the cut in point and the cut out point. So um, I've hooked it up to an ordinary regulator there. So you can see inside uh, there's a little copper bellows. So if I gradually increase the pressure, 
you can start to see this little plate move up, pushed upwards by the bellows, and it'll get to a point eventually when it'll trip this switch on the other side of the regulator. You'll hear it go click. There it goes. And now, um, if I reduce the pressure, it comes back down, it has to get to quite a lot lower before at that point it clicks back. So that's the differential. In, out. So the air tank is always maintained within a sort of range of, of pressures. Well, that's the regulator, but then there are these things on the outlet called filters. Uh, so when the air is compressed, it gets very hot. And then when it goes into the tank, it starts to cool down. And at that point, water often condenses out of the air. Um, then also, you have to fill the t uh, compressor with oil or, or to lubricate the piston. So there's also a bit of oil in the compressed air as well. So the filter is designed to get rid of some of that at least. So uh, just a fairly typical one like this. Uh, the, the main part inside is this filter cartridge. Uh, and that gets rid of quite a bit. And then uh, at the bottom, um, there's this uh, this one, I think, is a manual drain. You push the, the uh, little button to drain the water and oil out the bottom. Some of them are auto drain and do it automatically. Well, a little one like this is usually enough for powering my cylinders. Uh, but for some things, you need really, really uh, dry clean air, uh, like paint spraying. And then you have to have much more expensive uh, air cleaning uh, contraptions. Now when I first used pneumatics, I, I used uh, nylon tubing. Um, but actually it's very stiff and not very easy to use. Uh, compared to polyurethane, which I use now, uh, which is much, much nicer stuff and easier to use. Another good thing about polyurethane tubing, oh, there's some air coming through that uh, tube when I open the valve. Uh, if I just double it up and crimp it with a cable tie, uh, the, the joint is now completely airtight. Polyurethane tubing is flexible enough to work with these nice little laboratory tube clamps. You have to thread the tubing through the clamp to start with, uh, but then that's the flow unimpeded and then you just snap it shut and there it is, airtight seal. And amazingly this even works for 6mm tubing as well. And that's often very useful. Well, of course, tubing comes in lots of different sizes. Uh, you can get uh, curly ones that are sometimes useful uh, if the ram is moving, uh, you know, if it's on some other assembly that's moving about. Uh, and uh, you can also get very tiny uh, tubing down to two mil. So uh, to connect the tubing to the uh, compressor and two cylinders, um, now these uh, little fittings threaded at one end to fit into uh, a cylinder um, and then this is the end that fits into the tubing um, and you just push the tube in until it sits there and then you have to push it in an extra bit and then it's locked in and that's a completely airtight joint. To get it out you have to pull back this outer bit of plastic uh, and then it comes out again. So the way these quick fittings work, it's easier to see on a big one. So this one's for 10 mil tube uh, and this is one I've uh, stripped out. So there are quite a few parts to it. Um, but the key part really is this spring steel ring. And this tapered bit digs into the tubing as you push it on. and then it, it resists 
being pulled back up, back off. But the clever design of these plastic bits means that when you push the blue ring in, it forces the steel ring to expand and releases the tube. Very ingenious. Over time, the ring of spring steel um, can get quite embedded and then it can be quite hard to um, pull the fitting out again. I made myself a little tool like that which uh, helps in some situations. Um, long nose pliers are also quite a good tool to, to use for that. Well just to show that uh, the fittings are completely airtight I'll connect it to a piston and shows how easy it is which is great for trying things out quickly as well. Uh, and you can hear, or oh, the absence of noise tells you that there's no leaks. This tiny tubing, the 2mm stuff, I bought for some of the little pin rams, but I've actually found that it's very useful stuff for all sorts of things. I generally make my own fittings uh, so that's a bit of 1.5mm brass tube uh, joined to a bit of 6mm brass uh, rod that I've drilled out and that's just soldered it in there uh, and you can literally just push this 2mm tubing it's over the end of a bit of uh, brass and you th might think this would just push out, be forced out by the air pressure but of course the clever thing is that the force is, as always, um, the pressure times the area. And in this case the area is so small that the force is surprisingly small. I found that besides uh, using it for little pin rams, it'll actually make quite big rams work. So if I just connect this one up now. It won't work at full speed because not so much air can get through, um, but that's sometimes quite an advantage anyway. Um, and the force uh, of the ram um, can be as much as if you had big tubes, though uh, again it kind of takes longer to reach the uh, maximum force. But it can be very handy having uh, such immensely flexible <laughs> tubing. So the one other sort of fitting I should uh, mention are speed controllers. So uh, by itself, oh, this is back to the 4mm tubing, um, these rams move uh, almost instantly, very fast. Uh, but in some situations you, uh, I find I really want them to go a lot, lot slower. Uh, and that's where these things come in very handy. So these arrows are significant. It means that it allows air in uh, without any obstruction uh, at full pressure um, but it restricts the volume of air coming out uh, by turning the little uh, control screw on the on the top so if I replace these connectors to the cylinder with these speed controllers uh, I can then show you the result and the movement is completely different it's amazing how slow uh, you can get it to go and then if I just uh, adjust that, maybe... So you've got very fine control over the speeds in both directions. And I find these really essential for uh, most of the things that I make. So at their simplest, valves are just a simple little tap. And this is one where the tube just goes in each end. And of course you can get versions of this that are powered by electric. Uh, this has got a solenoid in the top and does exa exactly the same thing. Uh, quite often they have arrows on uh, just to indicate which way is connected to the compressor and which way is connected to uh, the cylinder. But uh, the problem with just a simple valve like this is that when you switch it off there'll still be a lot of compressed air 
trapped in the, in the piston and the cylinders. Uh, so they won't be, you won't be able to move them. So it's usually more useful that all that air is exhausted and just uh, allowed to escape. So pneumatic valves are normally a bit more complicated. So the pressure comes in here uh, and uh, goes to the cylinder out the other side. But there's this third port um, for exhausting the air from the cylinder out to the outside. But then it gets more complicated because to control a cylinder uh, you have to have two outputs, one to go to each end of the piston. This is the valve I was actually using for some of the earlier demonstrations. So, so it lets the compressed air into one side or the other. Well this is called a 5-2 valve because it's got the two outputs to the ends of the cylinder. The pressure comes in the middle and these are the two exhausts. These are silencers uh, to, uh, and they do make quite a difference. Um, it was useful doing the video because I didn't want too much extra noise. Uh, and of course uh, most of my machines though I wouldn't have them hand operated like this. I would want solenoid ones. This is an old spool valve I've stripped down to show how it works. So uh, these are the various parts of it. These are the two uh, outlets to the cylinder and on the other side the inlet for the pressure and the two exhausts. So the main moving part is in the middle here. It's called the spool and it's just a rod with a series of uh, seals on it. So when the spool is in place, you can sort of see the seals moving past the holes, outlets to the cylinder. So it's uh, blocking and unblocking different routes through the valve, if you like. So what powers the this spool to move across is small amounts of air that are fed into either end. Uh, and they come from... Uh, a tiny little solenoid in here. This bit is really just the connector, so that's sort of irrelevant really. Um, in here, the solenoid is really very tiny. The solenoid is actually in here. You can see the, the coil of wire just about under a bit of polythene. And this is the little, tiny little piston that it, oops, it shoots out. These are the tiny little air holes that the air goes through uh, and feeds into the end of the spool. So the solenoid doesn't have to be very powerful just to open these little holes uh, and it's really using the power of the compressed air to move the main spool to open the different pathways through the valve. Air assisted I think it's called. Well I uh, tend not to just use single ones like this but a whole bank of them, a manifold. So and this reduces the amount of pneumatic tubing going all over the place because you just put the pressure in there, the compressed air goes in there, and these are the outlets to the rams, uh, one solenoid for, uh, for each uh, ram. So it is a very nice little neat block. And this, this is actually SMC 3000 series. It's amazing how much air these can actually uh, pass through. Uh, I sometimes use the, the bigger, the 5000 or even the 7000. Um, it's not really that I find there's not enough air coming out of the little ones. It, it's more that uh, I sometimes worry that the holes through which the uh, air has to pass, so tiny in the little ones, they might sort of somehow get clogged up with moisture. I may be just being paranoid, but uh, um, th these are kind of slightly more reassuring being a bit bigger. Uh, oh, the other reason for buying them in manifolds is that I buy practically all mine second hand on eBay and uh, you tend to get better value if you have buy a whole sort of bank of them like this rather than individual valves. So one thing I quite often have trouble with uh, ordinary pneumatic cylinders is that they take up quite a lot of space in as much as uh, this one is about 200 mil long and if I extend it um, 
it extends uh, about another 40 mil. So it actually, the extension is only 20% of its total length. It's not a big uh, ratio. For that reason, there are these uh, compact cylinders and they have much bigger ratio. So uh, this one, the extension is about 35% of the total uh, length. So almost twice and double the, an, an ordinary cylinder. I sometimes use a pair of these compact cylinders back to back to make one that has a central stop position, which of course a single ram can't do. Try to reach the house at the top, but watch out for the villains. Whenever they pop out, freeze, or you will go down the ladder instead of up. So on the housing ladder, uh, there's, there's two drums uh, that rotate 120 degrees in each direction to uh, reveal the villains who are stopping you buying a house that you can afford. Uh, so underneath here, there are actually two little rams. So when the shake comes out, uh, ram th three extends, then back to neutral. And then when the buy to let woman comes out, uh, ram number four contracts and back to neutral. Another thing about cylinders is that they always have a magnet inside the piston. You can put a reed switch, a tiny little reed switch, on the top of the cylinder and it will sense the magnet and then uh, when it retracts it goes off. provides a unique opportunity to discipline the reckless bankers. It can be very useful to know when a cylinder has started to move, as it is on my Wacker Banker machine. When you hit the banker, it only moves the ram down just enough to switch off the reed switch. But this then activates a solenoid valve to power the cylinder down to the bottom, so it's much more satisfying. Now, really? Another limitation of ordinary cylinders is the piston is free to rotate, which is sometimes inconvenient. So there are special cylinders with hexagonal shafts to prevent this. And there are also ones with guide bars along the side to do the same thing. But these guide bars, they're not enough really to make a basic cylinder uh, resist side loads and things to make it into a full linear actuator. Um, for that, it needs really beefy guide bars, <laughs> like the big cylinder that lifted me up. So here, only the central rod is the cylinder. The outer ones are just the guide bars. Then there are grippers. This was a prototype for one of my machines. Quite a satisfying little thing. And this is a miniature parallel gripper. Just moves the jaws parallel in and out. And they're used a lot in factories and automation and stuff. Then there are rotary cylinders. Beautiful things. Uh, I live in hope that I'll find something to do with one sometime, but I've never actually used one. That's for adjusting the stop positions on the back, and then you get a nice substantial shaft on the front. And wonderfully quiet and smooth. If you want an even longer travel for a given length of a cylinder, there are these wonderful things called rodless rams. They're like a sort of conjuring trick, really. Um, the carriage moves almost the entire length of the cylinder. So, uh, how they work is very, very clever. Uh, this entire strip is a seal, really, and the carriage pulls up the uh, top metal part of the seal and pushes down the inner rubber part, enabling a connecting rod to go down from the carriage to the piston head uh, inside the cylinder. 
This is another sort of rodless ram. A beautiful thing with enormous amount of power. So the uh, the top and bottom bars are just guide bars. Uh, the ram is the thing in the middle. And it's just a very, very powerful rare earth magnet, um, which uh, attracts steel uh, round the carriage. I mean, I couldn't possibly shift it uh, uh, by my own uh, weight or anything. For several times, I've really wanted to base an arcade machine round. Uh, I even got as far as starting a prototype once, but it didn't really get anywhere. Then there are a whole range of air powered tools. Staplers and nailers, um, rivet guns, um, impact wrenches, uh, even drills, and of course spray guns. Oh, Sanders is another popular one. And although uh, they still have their fans, I mean, car body repairers sometimes love uh, air powered standers and uh, upholsterers, and some builders still use air powered nailers. I think. Uh, a lot of people are like me. I used to have some, but uh, I've rather converted to electric. But there is one air powered tool that I still love, and that's my uh, air powered rivet gun. Uh, and it looks a really ungainly beast. You would never expect it to be uh, a useful tool, really, but, and it's cheap. It wasn't an expensive thing. So if I uh, just prepare these. To join these two bits of aluminium, slip it over the end and pull the trigger. If I get to the right angle you can see it doing its business. A wonderful tool. I don't think I'd have made these goats without using one of these really. <laughs> One final sort of air powered um, device is a dentist drill. Now this is different, it's not like a cylinder obviously, it's actually a turbine, so it, it hairs round at enormous speed. And of course, there are many, many other exotic uh, actuators. The uh, catalogues are great big fat things about two inches thick. I thought it was worth including a section about low pressure and vacuum pneumatics. Uh, it still has a surprising number of uses. Uh, probably reached their zenith in the 19th century uh, with the atmospheric railways. So the whole trains were the pistons which sealed against the tunnels which were effectively the cylinders they travelled through. And these worked by vacuum sucking uh, the trains through the tubes. Uh, never successful, they could never really get the seals to work. Um, <laughs> partly because they, the leather kept being eaten by rats. But of course they survived on a smaller scale, um, the vacuum tube systems in banks and uh, department stores uh, that remained in place until the 1960s and 70s. I thought these were obsolete, but uh, in fact their company is still making them. Uh, the main customers now are hospitals, uh, rather bigger tubes. The uh, negative pressure created by a uh, vacuum um, is the difference between the air pressure or air all around us and the pressure created by the vacuum. Uh, so the maximum that can possibly be is one atmosphere, one bar. So vacuum is usually less powerful than compressed air, which uh, op operates up to six bar quite happily. But it's still, vacuum still can be quite powerful when the suction is spread over large areas. This is an even larger version of a pneumatic tube. Again, this works on suction. This is a domestic lift. So I weigh about 140 pounds and uh, it's about uh, 24 inches diameter. If you do the sum, the negative pressure needed to suck me up is absolutely tiny. 
In fact, the compressor that's powering it is something more like a couple of ordinary vacuum cleaners. That's actually a bit disappointing. I felt as if I should be going out, out into space. Surprisingly, vacuums can be created from compressed air with these little gadgets. They don't look very interesting. Inside, uh, it's really not much more than a modified uh, T-valve. But if you look closely down the barrel <laughs> where the air goes in, uh, I think you can just see uh, there's just a tiny hole. And this nozzle is what the air shoots through and then it expands on the other side through this brown bit. Uh, and this has the effect of sucking in air uh, to join the flow. A sort of Venturi effect. So if I uh, connect it up here, I think I can use it with a, a little sucker on the end of a tube to suck up a bit of paper. I turn off the supply. It actually has enough power to suck up a smallish bit of steel. Tiny bellows uh, have survived. My friend Paul Spooner likes using them uh, with low pressure pneumatics in his automata and encouraged me to have a go a few years ago. Um, we found this, these gaiters that are sold uh, for trailer tow hitches uh, and they make very good um, <laughs> bellows. Uh, so that was a good starting point. And then Paul also makes his own simple bellows this is rubberized fabric that's sold for repairing um, organs. Um, so if I connect the two together, you then got a very sort of sensitive actuator. <laughs> so the thing I made with it was part of uh, uh, the clock for the Exploratorium, the designers examining the plans in great detail. And surprisingly, even this sort of pneumatic still has industrial applications. I found this object in a scrapyard uh, a year or two ago. It's something off a, an Audi or a VW car. I've no idea what it does, but uh, obviously low pressure pneumatic still has its place in the world. This clock at London Zoo is almost entirely pneumatic powered. It's by far the most complicated pneumatics project I've ever attempted. It's been here 15 years now and I recently calculated the escapement has done 80 million cycles. The brief was the Victorian's attitude to the natural world. I wanted the clock to look decorative and not too techno, so I tried to keep all the pneumatics reasonably discreet. It actually has 35 cylinders to make it all work. Graham, my assistant at the time, did a brilliant job of hiding all the pneumatic tubing. Looking back, it was perhaps stupidly ambitious. It has been a struggle to keep it running. 
Just maintaining the compressor has been a nightmare. Originally, the compressor was inside the base of the clock, but it was really hard to get at to top up the oil and to drain the water out of the tank. Eventually, it got in such a state that we had to replace it and put the new one inside a storeroom in the building. Unfortunately, it's a tropical aviary, so here the air is very warm and moist. I could never have imagined quite how much extra water would condense in the tank. Then the final straw was that the air tube from the storeroom to the clock sprung a leak underground, chewed through by rats. The other main problem was getting the flying birds reliably back in their cages at the end of every performance. It was perfect for the first few years, but then they started to become erratic. Intermittent thoughts like these are always the worst. Since then, I have gradually improved things over the years, though they're still not perfect. I'm still proud of it, and even after 15 years, I still keep trying to improve it. I'm about to add an extra air tank and auto drains, and probably try yet another compressor, uh, this time an oil-free model that should need less maintenance. In the last 10 years or so, electric actuators have been encroaching on territory that was traditionally just pneumatics. And there are lots of advantages. Um, they use less energy. Uh, compressing air is not energy efficient at all. Then electric actuators, you can stop them mid-stroke. And with servo motors, you can know very precisely their position. And although mine move rather slowly, uh, there are certainly ones that can move just as fast as a, a pneumatic piston. So why then has pneumatics uh, remained so popular in factories and automation? Well I think really it's just because it's so simple and reliable. Once you've got the compressor, it is just a matter of plugging in a valve and a cylinder and you've got this linear motion. Um, you don't need limit switches, no uh, other control uh, and they have very long lives. Uh, none of the pneumatic cylinders in any of my arcade machines have ever given me any problem or the valves. Um, the zoo is a bit different but then the environment is uh, very challenging. Last summer an engineer from Disney World came to see me, recently retired. Uh, and he was saying how when he started his career all the animatronics were fluid powered, air or um, hydraulic. Uh, but through his career uh, more and more things were converted to electric, uh, enabling spectacular uh, new effects. Um, but he said he wasn't really sure whether that had been worth it, because the net result was that things were more often not working. Uh, not because the electric's not reliable, but they are much more complicated, so they need much more specialist maintenance. Uh, so you have to get people with specialist skill to do the maintenance, uh, and they're fewer and further between, uh, and uh, charge more for their time. So the result is just that things don't work as reliably as they used to in the past. So I think that's why pneumatic survives, because it's KISS technology, basically. Keep it stupidly simple, or keep it simple stupid. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode about pneumatics. See you next time. Bye.